I'm having to rethink the designation of New Brunswick as the Holy Land because I had a wonderful experience at my niece's wedding. It was a beautiful celebration and party afterwards. There's nothing like partying with family, particularly family that you haven't seen in a few years. It was just a great experience, but I came back with a horrible bug. And this is my fifth day on antibiotics, and they don't seem to be kicking in yet. The only good thing is I'm not contagious. So if you get sick this morning, it's not my fault. You didn't get it from me. I should be beyond that at this point. And uh, I have a son who loves to buy and sell online. Uh, he loves to go to, to yard sales. And uh, he has an eye for products that will resale. Uh, just a couple of years back, he went to a yard sale in town, and he came back with four women's purses. And I told him, now I'm worried. <laughs> and he said, you don't understand. These four purses that I bought for $40, one was a Louis Vuitton, one was a coach, etc., etc. He sold them online for several hundred dollars. I thought he's smarter than his dad, for goodness sakes. Good for you, son. So one night I went with him down to the 403 auction. How many of you have been to an auction before? What a cool experience. You wouldn't believe all the, uh, all the uh, crazy products that they have. And those who know what they're doing will march around taking an inventory of what they want to buy. But I noticed particularly that there were items my son was interested in, but he would not take them unless they had a certificate of authenticity. Because he said, if I get a certificate of authenticity, I can get triple the amount of money. You know that God has given us a great gift called eternal life, and he's provided with that gift all of the certificates of authenticity that we need to never doubt the certainty of our salvation. That's John's point in 1 John chapter 5. I want to show you this morning how that your faith is as strong Listen to me, your faith should be as strong as the witnesses that God has provided upon which it stands. So you need to stop your doubting and know that God has saved you by His grace and God has redeemed you to Himself and you belong to Him. That's in 1 John chapter 5. Will you come there with me please for the reading of God's Word? I'm going to begin at verse number 6 of chapter 5 and go all the way down to verse number 12. My goodness, I'm trying really hard not to get wound up so I can finish the sermon. I did pretty well in the first service. My wife said, you only shouted once. <laughs> but I want to tell you how sure your salvation is and how certain it is. I begin in verse number 6, and as always, let me remind you that the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it, because this is the Word of the Lord. This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning His Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Don't you love it when God tells us straight up about the truth of His Son? If you have His Son, you have life. It's that simple. If you reject Jesus, you're lost forever. I didn't make it that plain. God did. But I want you to see it this morning. So God says, there's a great gift that I've given you. That gift is eternal life. And I want you to see the four witnesses that John bears testimony to that, uh, that uh, give us the great confidence that we should have in this gift that God has bestowed. Number one, it's in verses six, excuse me, five and six. And it is that Jesus Christ is a faithful witness so we can trust him. He reminds us that Jesus Christ came. And of course, the whole theme of the book of 1 John is the identity of Christ and His mission in coming. 
But he's telling us what is the theme of the entire Bible. And the theme of the entire Bible is simply trusting Jesus. God bears witness to the fact that his son, who in himself is a witness, but he is the object of our confidence and our faith. So what does he say to us? Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and you should trust him. Because everything that he has ever said is absolutely true. Listen, in John chapter 5, Jesus had a debate with the Pharisees. And Jesus said to them, I know that you are searching the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And they, the testimony in the scripture, are of me. But you refuse to come to me that you will have life. That verse is a warning to people who do study their Bibles and who do not study their Bibles. It's a warning to people who study their Bible that you don't just study your Bible for the sake of learning more information to make you smarter or, pardon my grammar, gooder. I know that's not a right word. That's not the point of studying our Bible. And yet people's heads are fat and full with arrogant knowledge about the Bible. They can quote 10,000 verses. They know the Greek tense of every text in the New Testament. But they've missed the whole point. 10,000 hours of studying God's Word will not save your soul. It is the point to get to know Jesus. We study our Bible to see the portrait of Jesus. That's why we study the Bible. So that we can say, open our eyes, Lord, and show us wonderful things about your Son in the Word of God. What does John say? John says that Jesus is the faithful witness that we are supposed to trust Because trusting Jesus is the central point of the Bible. And we can trust Jesus because he's a faithful witness about the truth. How do I know that? I did this this past week. I went back and perused all 350 promises of the Old Testament or prophecies of the Old Testament concerning who Jesus Christ was. And he fulfilled every one of them. How could he not be a faithful witness? How could Jesus not fulfill in... in, Minute detail, every prediction in the Old Testament about him and anyone impugn him as anything less than who he said he was. You can't without bringing your own witness into question. Not only did Jesus fulfill 350 prophecies about the Old Testament, but the Bible says that he fulfilled all of the law. So Jesus Christ is the faithful witness that we're supposed to trust as we follow him in our lives. Now into the meat of this text. And I need to admit to you as we come into this text that they are considered to be, these next words about the witness of Jesus Christ, these next words are considered to be some of the mysterious, most mysterious in the book of 1 John, but also in all of the scriptures. The reason I'm telling you that is men and women who are much more educated than I in the scriptures and much more competent than all of us, can't quite agree on why John chose the word water and blood to describe the mission of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to tread ever so humbly in what I tell you. I'm simply going to admit that that great minds in God's kingdom have disagreed over the exact interpretation, but I don't think that's the point. The focus is that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness from God the Father, and the text says he came by water and the blood. That's the point at which Bible scholars say it's somewhat mysterious. We don't know exactly why he chose those words. The interpretation that I'm most comfortable with is that the water simply refers to the event where the ministry of Jesus was launched and at which the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. It's the, public, it's the beginning of His public ministry. The blood is, in my view, the best, most consistent interpretation. If the, if the water is speaking of His baptism at which His ministry was launched, and during which the Father spoke from heaven, then the blood is a reference to His ministry completed at the cross. You could summarize all of First John by saying His whole point was to attack the ancient heresy that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. He was not the Christ of God. And so everything that he said is to verify the true identity of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. So at his baptism, his ministry was launched. At his, at his death, he cried himself, didn't he? It is finished. Uh, 
most Bible scholars believe that John was addressing an ancient uh, heresy about the identity of Jesus Christ, called, uh, commonly known as Gnosticism. But this particular heresy was Serinthians. Uh, uh, it, it was a, um, a heretic called Serinthus. And he taught, and the Gnostics taught, that Jesus Christ was born of a natural union between Joseph and Mary, and that is, at his baptism, the divine spirit of the Christ descended upon him and remained on him throughout his earthly ministry and then departed when he was crucified. But see, that is a strike at the core belief of the incarnation, which is what? In the incarnation, Jesus Christ took on our nature so that he could take on our sins at the cross. If he was not fully and completely God and man, we're lost in our sins, we're damned forever. And John is simply reiterating, Christ's identity was always God who came in the flesh. He demonstrated it throughout his life and ministry. He died as a substitute for sin. And you need to trust the faithful witness that God has given from heaven about his son, Jesus Christ. Let me say it again, friends. John is painstakingly painting a portrait for us that Jesus Christ took on our nature in his birth, in the miraculous virgin birth incarnation, and he subsequently took on our sin at the cross, and if you deny either, you cannot be saved. And you cannot be certain. If you question his identity or his mission at the cross, you have no other hope. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so it's important that we see. When someone says to you, how do you know, Gigi, that you're saved? Your first answer should be, Jesus died for me. The Son of God came from heaven above as the Savior of the world to go to the cross to atone for my sin. And I know I'm saved because Jesus That's a one-word answer. Jesus. Not because of me or anything I've done, but because Jesus accomplished it all at the cross. That's John's point. Jesus Christ is a faithful witness upon whom you should always trust. Isn't that why Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If... It were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. What is he saying? My word, the word of the faithful witness called Jesus Christ, is trustworthy and true, and you should build your life upon it. The second witness, according to John, is in verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8, and it is the Holy Spirit. How do I know that I belong to God with certainty? Because of the faithful witness, Jesus Christ who I trust, and because of the Holy Spirit, who is a truth witness, who has enlightened me. Notice what he says. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus by enlightening our minds. Hey, work hard at this in understanding this with me. The text says it is the Spirit who testifies. That statement is in the present tense. So it means that the Holy Spirit's work in the world today is to announce to the minds of mankind what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, and the Holy Spirit is the one who testifies about the faithful witness. What does that mean? It means by all of the searching and reading that human beings can attain will not in itself bring a person to faith in Jesus Christ. Because there is no such thing as salvation without the supernatural enlightening ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I cannot read the facts and by human wisdom make the right conclusion about Jesus Christ. Why is that so? It's so because the the minds of those who do not believe are blinded by the enemy. You cannot see who Jesus is, who you are, the truth of God and his word without the mediatorial work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who opens your eyes. You're blinded without him. You continue to be blinded without him. So man cannot receive this witness. The question becomes then, how does the Holy Spirit testify to us? And the answer is that he testifies to us with inaudible words. You say there's no such thing as inaudible words. Yes, there are. Because John wrote to the seven churches in Asia Minor, you who have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. 
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that by the wisdom of man we cannot understand the truth of God. It is only by the wisdom taught by the Spirit. You see how dependent you are in simply listening to this message this morning upon the Holy Spirit? This will seem nothing more to you than a religious class. But when the Holy Spirit comes and opens your mind, you'll be able to say, I didn't, I've never seen that before. I've read this passage a thousand times. Lo and behold, I saw something new, something fresh, something exciting for my own heart. Who is that? If you're dependent upon the Holy Spirit simply for studying the Scriptures, imagine how dependent I am. I'm helpless up here. I'm completely useless up here. Unless the Holy Spirit is opening your mind and you're saying, teach me the truth of God. Holy Spirit, teach me the truth of God. I want to know. How does He do it? He doesn't whisper audible words in your ear. If He does, I have a doctor I'll give. doctor's name I'll give to you. But the heart that is shielded from the truth all of a sudden gets the point. I remember years ago, a young lady in our church dating the star football player and the local high school football team. And in the United States of America, high school sports are bigger than our national sports, national leagues. It's not uncommon to go to a football game on a Wednesday night and there'd be five, six, seven thousand people screaming at each other. Parents all wound up. And this young lady was dating the star football player. And I remember thinking, as the youth pastor at the time, I need to take him out over a burger, share the gospel with him. I was so excited about it. He's going to be my first convert. (laughs) I took him to lunch and shared the gospel as forthrightly as I could, as simply as I could. I, I gave him time to think about it. I gave him time to ask me questions. And in the end, I said to him, do you understand what I just told you? And he looked with a dumbfounded face and said, I don't have a single clue what you're talking about. I don't get it. I don't understand. I went away forlorn that day, about to learn the most important lesson of my spiritual journey. I'm not responsible for, nor do I have the power to convert a heart of mankind or change darkness into light. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. A few days later, late in the night, a knock came on my door. I opened my door and there stood that strapping young athlete with tears streaming down his face. And he said, I get it. I understand now. I know what you're trying to tell me. I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Became a part of our youth ministry. I was reminded it had nothing to do with man's work, but with the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's pause and and evaluate where we've been so far. He's telling you so far that you have two witnesses. One is is historical, one is experimental. One is a point in history. Another is when the Holy Spirit begins to work on the human heart, enabling you to understand who Jesus is and what God wants you to know from the truth of his word. So it's experiential, it's experimental. One is objective, one is subjective. But they're both witnesses to the fact that the gospel is real and God wants to give you eternal life. Let me show you the third witness in the text. It's in verse 9. It is God our Father is a reliable witness, so we can agree with Him. This text is telling us that God has given three witnesses to form a single divine testimony about Jesus Christ. The Father and the Son are witnessing to the importance of trusting Jesus, which is the central teaching of your Bible. And so he uses a simple argument here for trusting God's word. And he said, it's a common experience for you to strike deals, to write contracts, and to make promises to each other. And you do it on the basis of the word of a man. You know, remember the days when neighbors would make deals by simply shaking on it. And now you have to have a lawyer with 1,500 pages in fine print. But it's still based on the word of a man. I will keep my deal. I will keep my promises. The paper is simply enforcing the promises that you have made. Well, for goodness sakes, if we will live in that way in relationship with each other, how much more should we say, if God says it, that's good enough for me. If God declares it, I'll believe it. I'll stand upon it. Now, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to make the wrong conclusion here. I don't believe that faith appropriately activated in your life is to believe what you haven't yet studied and read. 
You need, you need to learn, you need to learn the Bible, you do, you need to learn the facts, so you, your mind is strengthened by what you learn in the study of the Bible. But in the end, having studied the Word with all your might, you say, God wrote this so clear and plain, I trust it. This is my last point, I'll get there in a moment, but simply, this promise, he who has the Son has life. That's a promise God has made. God keeps His Word. And I'm going to trust Him. At the moment of my last breath on earth, I'm going to recall, if I'm still in my right mind, if I have the Son, I have eternal life. I'm going to build my hope on the promise of God. I think He's simply saying, why would you not trust God's Word? Because that's the core of living by faith. Satan's strike at God in the garden was to get Adam and Eve to doubt his word. And he's doing that in your mind right now. He's, that's, his, that's his spiritual torment of your soul. Did God really say? Does it really work? Is that what it means? Oh, you know that people disagree about it, etc., etc., etc. Your faith will be as strong as you say. God himself is his own best witness and I will take him at his word. I know that's not particularly brilliant, but it is quite brilliant when you start trusting it. I still remember the Sunday morning as a young Christian when my pastor was preaching on Numbers chapter 23. It was one of the most important sermons I would hear as a young Christian. You remember the story of Balak asking Balaam to curse Israel as a prophet? And Balaam said, how can I curse what God has pronounced good? God put a word in Balaam's mouth, put an oracle in his mouth. And one of the things that he said in that oracle, to me, is one of the verses you should commit to memory. You should learn its truth and ask God to give you the courage to live by it. It simply says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should ever repent, turn back on what he said. If he says it, he'll do it. If he promises it, he'll deliver it. I'm trusting God whose word cannot be broken. That's the point of your faith. Your faith is weak or strong according to your determination and decision to stand upon the word of Almighty God. Jesus himself did it. In that famous passage in John chapter 5, where he called the evidence of all of the witnesses that God gave him, including the miraculous works that he was doing. But he said, the Father in heaven has borne witness to who I am. If you don't trust me, trust him. He said, I bring Moses as a witness. I have fulfilled all the promises made to Moses. If Jesus would build his confidence upon the word and promise of God, how much more should we? How much more do we need to? You say, Derek, I'm struggling with a weakening faith. I'm sure that I could follow you around for a few days and see that you've not been spending much time in God's word on your knees saying, open my eyes that I may see the truth, that it will bring me closer to Jesus. Because when you do that, your faith is strengthened. Still tracking with me, church family? Say, it's good to have you back, Derek. <laughs> Say, Max preached a good sermon, but we're glad to have you back. <laughs> Let me show you the fourth and final. It was the biggest surprise to me in the passage. Because the first three witnesses, in my view, are infallible witnesses. They cannot lie. They are incapable of failure. And everything they ever say, they will always do. That is, the Son the Holy Spirit, and the Father. But then this text calls us, as redeemed people, to be witnesses, along with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now just hold off for a second. If I were God, I would say your plan is flawed. You're going to commit such sacred truth into the hands of men to which he says, yes, because one of God's greatest witness is a life redeemed by grace. One of the greatest sermons that will be ever ever preached is someone who has believed in the testimony of Jesus Christ and continues to be filled with the Holy Spirit and walks with God and they are the greatest sermon that God could ever preach. Your life is a sermon that God is preaching to the world. You're reaching into places that His Word will never be preached. You are the witness, according to John. We who've been redeemed are the witnesses of God. 
squares with the rest of the Scripture, doesn't it? Dr. Luke said in Acts chapter 1, You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You're God's representative, God's ambassador, God's witness. So the next time you open your mouth, before you do open your mouth, listen to me, church family, before you open your mouth, tap yourself on the back. We spent a couple of days with my granddaughter recently, and I kept tapping her on the back saying, I love you, honey. And she went over to her mother at one point. Just because Grandpa did it and started patting her mother on the back. Saying, I want you to pat me on the back, Grandma. Tell me you love me. Pat yourself on the back and say, before you speak, remind yourself, you are an ambassador of the God of heaven. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you say has eternal weight and significance. And I am his witness. Now, this text tells us three things that you need to be a witness. The first is, he who believes in the Son of God as the Savior of the world. He says the first, the first transformation of a witness is believing God. You say, you're kidding me. Are we still talking of the simple act of believing? Yeah, because it's more than just a one-time event where I become a Christian. Believing God is a lifetime journey of rewriting the core processor of my brain from what the old man says to me and what God tells me is true. Believing God is walking through life and discovering on whatever point it is that you, your life is not squaring with what the Bible teaches and you need to alter it. Believing God isn't just saying, I accept Jesus as my Savior. It is, I accept every word that God has spoken. And I will work with great tenacity and passion to bring my life into compliance, parallel to the teaching of God's Word. This is a simple illustration, I know, but it works for me. Because I've done it more times than you could imagine. When people come to me, one of the things I always want to ask them about is, have you trusted Jesus? Tell me about the day of your salvation. Are you in a relationship with Jesus yet? So we get beyond that. Then I say, now tell me, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God loves you? And you know what they'll say to me? Almost 99% of the time, I believe God loves the world. But that's not what I asked you. I asked you if you knew that God loves you, Gigi, you. Not somebody else. And, and they often have to say, well, I have a harder time with that. Because I know me. And I don't always like me. If people are honest enough, they'll tell you that. Because they remember their failures. And they struggle in self-condemnation of, of their own journey. And I just keep pressing it. Well, don't sit here and say you believe. You're not yet fully believing. Until you see that the word written is directed at you. And your life is being changed by the word that has been written. So okay, God loves the world. That's great. Isn't that wonderful? Let's all clap. God loves the world. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. God loves you. Broken, sinful, weak, and troubled as we are. He loves you. That's just one point of what it means to believe. I have found a thousand of those illustrations in my own life. (laughs) Here's what God says. Here's how I really think as I examine my behavior. This is how I really think. I've got to work on believing. I've got to believe in a new way, in a fresh way, in a strong way. Once you believe, the text says, then you have the witness of the Spirit in you, the testimony of the Spirit in you. What is that? That's the assurance of eternal life. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, he's not given us the spirit of fear uh, to go back again to the bondage that we were in before Christ, but he has given us the spirit that sets us free. And that spirit is the one who witnesses in us, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You shouldn't be surprised that anybody doubts. Thomas did. It's always intrigued me that Thomas doubted having spent uh, intimate Long years with Jesus, and yet Jesus didn't rebuke him. He simply said, look at the evidence. Here's the testimony. Here's the witness. Now stop your doubting and believe me. What did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. 
The problem isn't that God has not, that God has failed to give you all the witnesses that should convince you forever that He has forgiven you. It's that you just refuse to believe at that level. But you're resisting even the presence of the Holy Spirit. So in the times, dark times in my life when I have doubted, I listen, read, pray, and then all of a sudden I hear this inaudible voice somewhere, somewhere in my journey saying, you know, you know you're trusting Jesus. You know you belong to God. You know the transaction is completed. It's finished forever. That's the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for his relationship in our hearts. So we are redeemed witnesses on God's behalf of the great value of what? Of eternal life. What does he say in the text? He who has the Son has life. This is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life. What is eternal life? The obvious answer would be um, a place in heaven where we will live when we die. But that's not the right answer. It's ultimately where we're going to end up. Eternal life, as defined by the same author in the first chapter, is to have fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, through the ministry of His Holy Spirit, and with His people called the Bride of Christ, the Church. So one of the greatest witnesses that we can bear as believers is participating in, supporting, and being active in, and being accountable to the local church. Because it is a core part of eternal life. Did you hear me? The single greatest damnable practice going on by professed Christians in Canada today is to think that they are rogue Christians accountable to no church and they can say and do whatever they want in the name of Jesus Christ. That's baloney. By the way, I was having lunch recently with a friend of mine who's a Greek scholar. I shouldn't tell him this, should I, Max? I just thought it was really funny. He told me something, and I said, I, I, th- I know what that is. I know what you just told me. He said, what is it? I said, it's B-O-L-O-G-N-E. And he looked at me with all seriousness, and he said, balogne. <laughs> it's a Greek word. I said, no, baloney. I hope my words will ring in your ears. It's baloney if you think you can be a Christian and diss his church. And the greatest witness that we have is the witness we have together in the community of the church. That's the witness that God has called us to give to the world. Let me conclude by reminding you that faith is not in an idea or a system of belief, nor even in a fact, but in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And upon belief in Him, my faith is as strong as the witnesses God Almighty has given Stop your doubting. Quit subjectively examining yourself and say, the only hope of my eternal life is to stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the blessing God Almighty has given to him and the work of his Holy Spirit in my life. And it's done, forever done. Are you sure that you have life? It's uncomplicated. You have life when you say to Jesus, be my Savior. This text says, whoever has the Son has life. What does that mean? You take Him as your own. You partner with Jesus. Snuggle up to Jesus. Start following Jesus. Get to know Him. Open your heart to Him. You have life. Now and for eternity. Father, I thank You for this indescribable gift of eternal life. Which is to say, how can we ever thank You enough that we are in a right relationship with You today and we're hearing Your voice through the Holy Spirit and we're learning who Jesus is more and more and we're loving the gift of His grace and what He did for us at the cross. And so, Lord, I pray that the doubting will give way to deep confidence that will never be shaken because we build upon the witnesses of Your Word and Your Son and Your Spirit. And thereby, we become the witnesses that you have called us to be and that you want us to be. Make your church a witness of Jesus, I pray, in his name. Amen.